Clowns, buffoons, fools, jesters, jokers of one kind or another have been part of the history of almost every culture in civilization. The comic actors of the Roman Empire are probably the direct predecessors of the jesters of the Middle Ages. Although there were no professional jokers at that time, comic actors are likely to have been the forerunners in both their style of comedy and attire. Many Roman emperors decided to rid their empire of actors, claiming them to be damaging to society. Whilst fleeing persecution, those performers spread their trade all over Europe, possibly leading to the development of the jester in later years. Although it should be noted that jesters were prevalent in other countries such as China and India. The wish to be entertained, and the need to laugh, was and still is universal. During the medieval period, lucky jesters were the ones who were employed by nobles or royalty to perform at court. But he or she wasn't just an entertainer, they were part of the social fabric of a region. Court jesters were valued with great privileges. Let's travel back in time and take a look at the life of a medieval jester. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Between the 12th and 17th centuries, the term minstrel, meaning little servant or glee man, described any person who was a professional entertainer of any sort. This included acrobats, jugglers, and even storytellers, but more specifically, musicians. During the Middle Ages, many of these minstrels toured from place to place, staying for a short time in a town or village whilst business was good. Although some of the most talented and well-respected were permanently employed at the royal court or by other rich households whilst they were able to command a high salary. These minstrels could be found across the whole of Europe. In France, they were known as jongleurs or troubadours. In Germany, minnesingers. They were called scops in England, skulls in Scandinavia, and bards in Ireland. Travelling from place to place, they not only provided a source of entertainment with their ballads and stories, but they also served as a way of delivering the news. Information from the villagers would be shared with the minstrel who would impart this news to the townsfolk in the next village they performed at. During the period of the Middle Ages, a person's station in life was governed by the family that they were born into. A blacksmith would teach his sons how to be blacksmith, as would a stonemason. A peasant would remain in the lowest social rank, but the European jester could come from any background. They might be a clerk whose falling around had amused a noble, a cottager who was known for their wit and joke telling, or even an ex-monk who had been expelled from the abbey for their antics. It wasn't easy being a jester. It was a job that needed intelligence and quick-wittedness. A fantastic memory was essential for memorising any epic poetry, heroic stories, or even just the news that you spread between villages. There was also a need to be able to improvise and adapt, depending on the audience. Children would want to hear pretty lullabies, whilst the older people would prefer a retelling of some bloody war story or another. Tact was also a requirement. A jester needed to appear whenever needed, but fade into the background when required to, which was a skill in itself. Jesters were given a free reign to say whatever they liked, but they had to be careful that they didn't upset too many people or go too far. There were two sorts of fool, natural and artificial or licensed. Either way, those that had physical deformities such as misshapen limbs, hunched backs, or exceptionally ugly faces were particularly valued, as were dwarfs. They used their physical appearance to their advantage to gain extra laughs. There are stories of natural fools being recruited from poor families as they were thought to have been touched by God. A disabled child or adult would be a huge financial burden to a peasant family, and it would have been a great help to have them taken on and cared for by a wealthy one. The fool would be unpaid, but provided with clothes, bed, and board. Once these poor souls were no longer amusing to the household, they were cast out, and although some were given alms regularly, most sadly ended their days as beggars. The tradition of having a fool at court dates back much further than the Middle Ages. They were employed not just for entertainment, but also to ease the mental pressures for both the monarch and his nobles. 
In this way, the jester would help their employer to focus better on their duties and political affairs. By the end of the 12th century, the name Fool began to be used when describing a jester who had earned payment in the manner of land as well as the freedom to leave court, although they did have to agree to return as and when required. During the medieval period, court jesters were held in great esteem, especially in the royal household. This prized position meant that they could tease their patron without causing too much offence, often speaking the harsh truth to their superiors disguised as humour. This ability was known as the jester's privilege, and although people laughed at their silly stories underneath, the folly was usually a lot of common sense and cleverness. It was a complex job that required much thoughtfulness, insight, and discretion as the jester of Philip VI of France found out. In 1340, Edward III of England defeated the fleet of the French King Philip VI at Sluys. Of course, no one wanted to give Philip the bad news. It was left up to his fool, who, once in the king's presence, was heard to mumble, <coughs> Those cowardly English men. Those chicken-hearted cowards. Hmm. How so? asked the king. Why, because they had not courage enough to jump into the sea, like your own sailors, who went headlong from your ships, leaving them to the enemy, who did not dare to follow them. Court was often controlled by fear and insincerity, and it was essential that the truth be dressed up as silliness in order for it to be accepted. It's impossible to know how many crazy ideas a jester had discouraged by whispering into the king's ear, or how many calamities were caused because of his bad advice. As far as physical entertainment went, singing, dancing, acrobatics, and juggling were all indispensable skills for the jester, as well as being able to play an instrument, perform ventriloquism, puppetry, and sleight of hand, even when carrying out their main job, that of making their employer laugh. Part of the comic appeal of the jester was their traditional costume, which was also meant to cause amusement. During the early medieval period, it was not unusual for the head to be completely shaved. Then, they would wear a hat with the ears of a donkey on top of their head. Some would also wear a donkey's tail as well. Later, a cowl was worn, similar to that of a monk, which would fall off onto the shoulders to give them a comical look. This hood was usually topped off with a cock's comb, the comb of a rooster, which was traditionally used to adorn a fool's headpiece. By the late medieval age, the hat had evolved. Made from a soft cloth, it now had three points, which represented the ass's ears, worn in the earlier period. A jingling bell was fastened onto the end of each point, called the cap and bell. This is the design that we associate with a fool's hat today. They might also carry a type of pretend scepter, known as a bauble or marat with a carved miniature grinning head on the end. It would often be made to look like the jester themselves, and was also adorned with a cap and bell. Some fools carried a mock weapon, such as a wooden sword, an inflated bladder on a stick filled with peas to make a type of large rattle, or a padded club. These types of props were used to add extra quirkiness to their cavorting. A motley coat or tunic was worn, made from bright, mismatched colours such as red and green, or yellow and blue. This was meant to highlight a lack of symmetry and give emphasis to the mayhem and unpredictability of the fool. Many also had bells around the skirt or at the elbows, so that the jester could be heard tinkling wherever they went. Bi-coloured, tightly-fitting breeches and stockings were worn on the legs. The whole outfit was usually designed by the fool themselves and had to be maintained regularly. In contrast, the natural fool would usually be dressed in a long gown. The role of messenger was also part of the job description for a personal jester to a king or nobleman. They would go into battle with their master and the rest of the troops and deliver messages to the opposing side, such as terms of surrender or conditions for the liberation of hostages. Jesters were traditionally thought to be scared, and it was customary for them not to be harmed in any way, but that was not always the case. If the message happened to be something that the opposing army did not want to hear, it would be the fool that suffered the consequences. It was not unusual for the angry leader to shoot the messenger right back at the enemy by loading him into a catapult or trebuchet. It was to be hoped that the jester would have already been killed beforehand, and that it was their severed head that would fire back. But sometimes, unfortunately, it was a live fool that was sent airborne. However, 
One minstrel that showed himself to be more than just the average jester was the Norman dwarf named Taillefa. He was a French jongleur who travelled over from France with William the Conqueror during the Norman Conquest. By mid-battle, the French were becoming weary and in danger of defeat. On horseback, Taillefa juggled a sword while singing the Song of Roland at the English troops during the Battle of Hastings. His antics caused one English soldier to break ranks from the shield wall. Taillefa saw his opportunity and attacked the Englishman, decapitating him. He then charged at the English line, killing more enemies before he was overcome. Taillefa is credited with lifting the spirits of the French army, which then rallied and won the battle and subsequently the kingdom. And he is not the only jester of note. Many were quite powerful and had great influence throughout medieval society. Roland the Farter was court jester to King Henry II of England in the 12th century. Actually an accomplished flautist, he was famous for the art of breaking wind, and was especially sought after during Henry's Christmas festivities. There, the charmingly named jester would perform a simultaneous fart, whistle, and jump. Roland was so well respected by his king that he was rewarded with the 30-acre Hemingstone Manor, as well as an annual payment. At the court of Edward I, known as Longshanks, Tom the Fool was awarded the huge sum of 50 shillings because he performed so well at the wedding of Princess Elizabeth. Many others were also able to take advantage of their position and turn their good fortune into wealth, helping to obtain profitable deals and jobs for friends and family. Another jester who was determined to make the most of his skills was Rahir. Using his wit, he became invaluable to the nobility, and was referred to as a minstrel. He was particularly good at making fun of people and spreading outrageous gossip behind their backs, amusing everyone who was listening. Not only did he perform clerical work, but he also became jester to King Henry I in the early 1100s. Rahir would at times adopt the behaviour of an idiot, which greatly entertained the servants and children. He is reported to have fallen ill on a pilgrimage to Rome, where he had a vision of St. Bartholomew. On his return to London, he founded the hospital of the same name to create a sanctuary for those less fortunate. In China, Shen Jiangoa, also known as gradually stretching taller, was employed as a jester during the 10th century in the state of Southern Tang. He was so influential that he was able to make the emperor Li Bien reduce taxes. In the midst of a drought, he made a joke that even the rain was afraid of being taxed and would not come into the land. Li Bien was so amused that he cut taxes immediately. Legend has it that it rained that very night. He is also believed to have saved the emperor's life. Li Bien invited his enemy Zhao Ben to a banquet. Ben sneaked poison into a goblet of wine before he offered it to Li Bien for a toast. Shen quickly grabbed the cup, and sacrificing himself for his emperor, he drank the poisoned wine himself. Despite being given antidote, sadly Shen died from a burst brain. Whereas in Saxony, Germany, rather than being looked at as a clown, Klaus Nahr was regarded as being a wise man during the late 15th century. Much was written about him, and he was known for his moral stories and parables. He is even thought to have been able to predict the future. During the Middle Ages, women were considered the property of their fathers or husbands, and had very few privileges, but some were lucky enough to become successful as jesters. For them, it meant they had the freedom to insult men of power without consequence. The job was one of the few that was completely open to women, who could enjoy the same benefits as men without any stigma. Many female jesters accompanied the queens and ladies of court, such as Archuard de Puy, who was full to Jeanne, the queen of Charles I of France. In 1373, we know that Jeanne paid the large amount of 170 gold francs for a dress for Archuard, who was obviously well cared for. Another female jester was Madame Dor, who entertained everybody at the Festival of the Golden Fleece in 1429 in Bruges, Belgium. And Margaret, the granddaughter of Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, also had a female fool who was allowed to sit in a chariot with the ladies-in-waiting when travelling with her mistress. One nameless female jester arrived at the court of Edward II, who was celebrating the festival of Whitsuntide at the Hall of Westminster in 1316. She trotted into the hall on a horse and rode around telling jokes to the king and his eminent guests. At the end of her performance, she approached the king and placed a letter in his hand before graciously riding away. The letter actually contained a petition of complaint against the abundant favour that the king had lavished upon the undeserving, 
whilst his faithful knights and trusty servants were neglected, no one else would have dared to hand over this letter, but jesters were allowed free access everywhere. Perhaps this female fool was also aware of King Edward's love of any joker who could ride a horse or to be more precise, could fall off of a horse. He previously paid one jester who continually tumbled from his mount the princely sum of 20 shillings, double that of another fool who could only dance for his king. Some of the customs that we now enjoy during the Christmas period date back to the Middle Ages and before. Singing carols, giving gifts, decorating homes, and overindulging were all part of the medieval festivities. The Lord of Misrule was a respected position within noble houses and at the royal court. The jester would be expected to play the role over Christmas. It was a demanding job. Festivities needed to be organised properly to guarantee that everything went well, and the reign of the Lord of Misrule could last anywhere from 12 days to 3 months. There were masked parties, the procession of the Yule Log, and feasts that all needed to be planned. Sometimes the festivities would include mummers' plays. The origins of mumming date even further back than the Middle Ages through Europe and into Russia. Medieval mummers were a group of travelling actors who would perform religious plays at Christmas, travelling from house to house. Most of the plays had a biblical theme, but were mainly for entertainment. So, the medieval jester was valued, not just endured, and their relationship with the townsfolk and those at the court was often warm and friendly. Ever the diplomat, they were the voice of reason for many monarchs who were brought up to believe that they had divine right and were answerable to no one except God. They could save an innocent from the king's fury with just the telling of a joke, therefore saving the king from himself. Although their verbal attacks could be scathing, there was usually an undercurrent of compassion and real insight. The fool was on the side of the ordinary people, fighting against oppression, making them liked by all, whether lord or peasant. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. We upload videos every week, so be sure to subscribe if you like the content. Cheers!